Yanisa, you may start. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, to talk about raising autonomous children. Um, well, first, we would like you to we would like to invite you to make a wish to think if you could wish one thing for your child or children what would that be what do you want for your child as they grow old and transition into adulthood okay i'm gonna give you a few seconds to think about it and if you want to share you can write your responses in the in the chat There's one comment, to be confident in herself. Mm -hmm. A parent wrote, confident. Another parent wrote, to be happy. To be independent and we with high sense of self-esteem. That's another comment. To be happy. Happy. That's a pretty common wish. Okay. Well, so if, if you think about what these things you wish look like, if you try to imagine how will they look like, maybe, maybe your definitions about uh, these goals are pr probably based on your family values and approaches to parenting or even, you know, social expectations, right? Uh, I think we are all interested in helping children transition into adulthood with the right skills. Uh, for some of Jenny, please, uh -huh. um, Miss, Miss Chami, can you please stop sharing your screen so that we can share this, the presentation again? Who? Me? Yeah, we can't, we can't see the... Um... You cannot see the presentation? Okay, no. wait a minute. Share again. Oh, Miss Miss Chami is presenting. There's another person presenting. Okay. Now I'm gonna share again. Okay. So we were saying that uh, we all want, right, to, to help children uh, transition into adulthood with the right skills. As you mentioned, uh, for some of you might be independent. Uh, for some of you will be like, you know, taking moral values, family values into consideration. Uh, so today we want to discuss about autonomy and because uh i think that uh for many of you uh one of, of those goals uh is related to helping your child to become an independent adult right and that independence it's related to the autonomy so we're going to start defining what is autonomy the term autonomy literally means self-governing and thus connotes regulation by the self. So in short, autonomy concerns uh, the extent to which a person's acts are self-determined instead of being coerced or compelled. 
Within the field of psychology, uh, the concept of autonomy is both central and controversial. Autonomy is central in that developmental personality and clinical psychologists have long considered autonomy to be a hallmark of maturation and healthy or optimal functioning. It is also controversial because it's often confused with concepts such as independence, separateness, and free will, generating debates concerning its relevance and importance across periods of development, gender and individualist versus collective cultures. So, any behavior can be viewed as lying along a continuum ranging from less to more autonomy, okay? The least autonomous behaviors are those that are motivated by externally imposed rewards and punishments. Externally regulated actions are dependent on the continued presence of outside pressure or reinforcements and thus in most contexts are poorly maintained because they depend on uh, an external coercion. Somewhat less control are interjected regulations in which a person's behaviors are regulated by avoidance or sh of shame and guilt and on the positive side by desires for self and others approval. Still, more autonomous are integrated regulations in which the person con consciously values his or her actions and finds them fighting with his or her other values and motives. A person who acts from a deeply held moral belief will be acting uh, from an integrated regulation and will feel very autonomous. Finally, some behaviors are intrinsically motivated, which means they are inherently fun or enjoyable. For example, a student who plays tennis after school just for fun is in intrinsically motivated and will feel autonomous in doing it. Several theorists in social and personality psychology have suggested that autonomy is a basic psychological need. This is because in general, when, when people uh, ha behave autonomously, they, they feel better and perform better. When parents and teachers use rewards to control behavior, uh, take away their choices or closely watch over them, children, typically feel controlled. Conversely, when authorities pr provide others more choice and allow them to express opinions and make inputs and provide uh, positive and non-critical feedback, they foster greater, greater autonomy and enhance motivation and persistence. Autonomy is a concept that is often uh, confused with independence, okay? One simple way to distinguish these ideas is to think of, of independence as not relying on others for resource or support, whereas autonomy concerns uh, more in how volitional or self-determined one is. Thus, people can be autonomously or willingly dependent as when they choose to rely on someone else for help, request help or, or ask somebody uh, for support. And people can also be forced to rely on someone else, in which case they will lack autonomy because they are they're being forced to do so. Uh, similarly, one can be heteronomously etern independent as when forced to go it alone or autonomously independent as when one desires to do something by oneself without getting help. So as you can see, they are interconnected, uh, but they're not the same. Uh, research has suggested uh, that adolescents who autonomously rely on parents tend to be better adjusted than those who are more 
detached or independent from parents. It is also clear that cultures differ greatly in values regarding independence. For example, <clears throat> for more individualist cultures, placing greater value on people's acting independently, while collective, collective cultures are more focused on in interdependence. Research suggests, however, that whether a person engages in individualist or collective uh, practices, it still mat matters uh, whether or not they feel autonomous. It appears that people in all cultures feel better when they are acting by choice, even though when they normatively do may fear. This is why people around the world often fight for freedom and the right to pursue what they truly value. Autonomy also is something that can be cultivated from within because autonomy concerns regulating behavior through the self. It is enhanced by a person's capacity to reflect and evaluate his or her own actions. One can learn to engage in reflection that is free, relaxed, or interested, which can help one to avoid acting from impulse or from external or internal compulsion. Such reflective processing is characterized by the concepts of awareness and mindfulness. Greater mindfulness can help people be clearer about why they are acting as they are and can provide information that helps them subsequently act with more sense of choice and freedom. Now, how, how can we help children become independent adults? An, an essential step toward accomplishing this goal is educating parents about autonomy supportive parenting. Uh, parents who support the development of autonomy are involved in their child's life, but encourage independence and problem solving skills. It is important for parents to give children both age appropriate autonomy and agency. By doing so, you help them develop at an appropriate level, and this can have the effect of greater emotional well being. When children are autonomous, they are more likely to feel capable of making their own healthy choices. By supporting children in the development of autonomy and agency, parents also help children learn about family values, social norms, and essential rules. And this is, this is uh, really uh, important to take into consideration because if we go back to these slides and we, we, we uh, go back to the idea that autonomy also is something that can be cultivated from within, I, I always tell parents that uh, the, the difference between uh, making a, a good or poor choice relies on what the child considers as you know uh as as good or wrong or right or wrong based on their values their family values um of course children in their process of of met, of development uh they they are um they are developing uh, these skills of, of making choices. And of course, as we always tell them, it's okay to make mistakes, but the most important thing is to learn from those mistakes. And as part of, for example, at school, when we talk about different types of situations and they have to reflect on, on what they did, one, one question I always like to ask them is like, um, a, how do you think your parents are going to feel if they find out what what you did? And of course, that that um, a, provokes you know a reaction that you can see in their face. And and one of of the favorite responses is disappointment. And from there, we 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 make that connection. Uh, from the, from where they can start reflecting about what they did and 
what lesson do they achieve from that situation and how they can act differently in the future. But these conversations are based on, on, on what, what, the, uh, what the child considers as, you know, what can be disappointing or not. And, and some of these, um, some of these uh, conclusions come from their awareness about uh, what what his or her family uh, has shared uh, from what they think it's right or wrong. I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm explaining myself. In other words, it's like helping the child understand that this is wrong because, you know, socially, let's say if, if, if you hit someone or you push, push someone or you display like a bully behavior so we're a classmate or something, um, these behaviors are not socially accepted, but also if we go home and we uh, ask our parents about what happened, of course they're gonna feel disappointed because they also think these things are, are wrong, not just because they're not socially acceptable, but because, but because also for our family is not acceptable. So um, I will say that every situation can be a great opportunity to talk to our children about our family values because these, these values and, and you know social norms and, and essential rules are implicit. No, no one is like talking about them all the time. We display them, we live through them, we model them for them, for, for children. So once in a while, every time it, it came up the opportunity to, to have these conversations. It's important to bring that to consciousness and to tell children like, well, in this family, we value honesty because this and this and that. Or in, in this family, in our family, we value respect. And, and, and you can clearly define how honesty look like, how respect look like. For children, it's important to understand how this abstract concepts might look like in you know daily life so um i know every family have their own values and respond you know to, to social norms and essential rules but they are implicit and sometimes we have to bring them you know to consciousness through explicit conversations so so can children be more clear about what our are our, our values and beliefs and and attitudes and behaviors that are acceptable in our in our family okay because that helps them develop that um autonomy that comes from within at at, at the end uh, it's about you know when when a when a person and you can think about yourself when you were growing up especially when you were teenagers and you had to make choices about i don't know having a drink or smoking a cigarette or something it was like this you know the evil figure and the and the angel figure that are represented by, by this type of, of images. But it's more like the moral voice that comes from um, our family values. It's, it's, at the end, it's our parents' voices here in our shoulders reminding us about what 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 is right and what is wrong. So that that is a, that's something that I would like you to to think about and take into consideration when you are um, addressing these conversations about values and beliefs that are important for your family. So parents can support the development of autonomy by uh, providing a rational, and ex a rational and explanation for family rules, as I just said, and behavior expectations, clearly defined behavior expectations, when children and adolescents understand the reasons for rules and the context behind them, they have an easier time supporting and following those rules. Labeling and validating a child's uh, feeling and perspectives is also important. It, it is essential. It, this is an essential component of mental health and growth. By normalizing emotions, uh, parents can help them understand that everyone has challenging moments. And this also helps children learn that strong feelings are nothing to be ashamed of. Also, uh, minimizing judgment and control by adopting a more collaborative parenting style. Uh, parents make room for children to develop greater autonomy. 
um, a, and this in turn helps children develop the skills necessary to become independent adults. Also, allowing children to make choices by providing age appropriate opportunities uh, for children to make independent choices and decisions, parents are giving them a healthy sense of agency and control. Supporting growth and new challenges by scaffolding and practicing new skills with children. In, in construction, scaffolding help, helps supply extra support to the building uh, that you're trying to, to erect. And then when the building is finished, the scaffolding is removed and the structure is able to stand independently. Parents who use scaffolding education offer children similar support. Scaffolding skills incorporate information and skills children already have. This approach helps foster greater autonomy and independence. It's like if you're trying to model them and to try to support and when to support them, and then when you when you see they are ready, you start removing those uh, those uh, support resources. Um, letting children solve problems on their own. Uh, parents of, often feel uh, uh, is that they should swap in and rescue their children when they encounter a challenge. But when problems arise, it's often better to brainstorm together and list possible solutions to the challenge at hand. Uh, for guidance uh, when needed, but encourage youngsters to problem solve independently. And let children struggle. Safely, of course, every child encounters failure at some point. Uh, trying and making mistakes or failing is part of growth. If, if children do not develop healthy coping mechanisms around failure, they are more vulnerable to anxiety. And it is essential for parents to model that failure and making mistakes are, part, are essential parts of the learning process. By letting children uh, learn from their mistakes, we are giving them important opportunities to develop res resilience, great confidence, and coping skills. So now Ms. Roxana is going to uh, talk to us about uh, more detailed examples of how we can achieve these okay. goals. So after all this introduction about what autonomy really is and why it is so important for us to promote that autonomy in our children, I'm going to share with you like two aspects in which families can share um, this uh, importance for autonomy in their children. So this, the first one is chores for children. I don't know if I'll families do that, but this time that we are at home is the perfect opportunity to um, encourage our children to also help with things at home. It is very important to consider their age and personality. Later, after this um, slide, I'm going to share like a chart with some ideas about chores that are age appropriate and also the personality. And it's very important because um, a teacher that is a friend was sharing with me yesterday. We were talking about this presentation and she was saying that one of her child had to, her chore was to turn, make sure that every light in the room was off when no one was using it. And, but she was afraid of the darkness. So when it was late at night, can you imagine this, this girl all scared about the darkness and it was her short. So we need to find shorts. It's like making an agreement with our children about what are the things that they will enjoy doing and that they would feel that they are helping the household. So in the next slide, we have this, and I'm not going to get into details, but we're gonna send this presentation also. And you can see, I'm gonna just go over some examples that according to their development, physically, cognitively, emotionally, they, can, they are able to do certain things. So for example, if your child is two or three years old, they can put the toys and books away. They can water the plants with some support maybe at the beginning. Um, if your child is four or five, they can make their own bed. 
they can set the table for meals maybe not uh you know forks and knives but they can uh put their own plates if there are six and from six to eight maybe they can clean the bathroom sink and wipe down kitchen benches i mean it's up to your family and you can sit down with your child and have this conversation like okay now that we're spending so much time at home we're all a team and maybe we can divide the shores from the house and you can also help so you can have this conversation with them about the things that are important in your house and they can also give you ideas about the things that they would like to do of course you need to consider that it's age appropriate that it's it matches their personality because we don't want to traumatize our children with stories that they will be scared about or and we want to make sure that it's like the right fit for them and also that at the end of the day they feel that they are useful to their to their family so this is one and then the second one is feedback so feedback is helpful information or criticism given to someone to indicate what can be done to improve something. It is important to mention that we always give feedback and I wanna focus uh, this part on the e-learning a little bit, not at all, but I want you to think about the e-learning and all the assignments uh, that your children need to do and also their daily life activities. So if I, as a parent, do everything for my child even though i don't speak a word the feedback that i'm giving my child is that he or she is not able to do it and that is why i need to do it for them okay so you're not you don't have to say a word but by only doing it this is a message that they get and this was a huge impact on their self-esteem on their will to be autonomous and also on their believe that they are able to accomplish new goals and and new uh, projects that they have so today i would like to share with you um a stroke from an article that is called helpful tips for sharing feedback with your child and it's from big life journal so i hope this is useful for you these are some tips that you can actually implement at home or ideas that you can have in mind while giving your children feedback it can be related to a learning or not but I hope that this is useful for you. So the first one is pause before you give feedback. And I really like this quote that is like the image that is printed there. And actually, it's, it's a poster on my office in the school. And it says, think. Like, T, is it true? Before you speak, you need to think. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? So before giving feedback to your child, take a moment to reflect on the necessity and intent of your words. How many times we do this? Is this feedback productive to them? Is it gonna help them grow or improve? What is my goal with this feedback? Is it necessary? What would happen if I didn't give it? Would it be the same? what impact is going to make on our child's ability to do something on their own. So this is very important because I've heard parents that tell me, oh, you know, they're, they, need to, um, you, they need to send an assignment about writing and then, but they, but every single word is not spelled well, I don't know, first, second graders. And I usually tell them that if they correct the mistakes for them, they're taking away the opportunity for this child to learn from their own mistakes. Because uh, the important thing here is that mistakes are a part of life. We all make mistakes and they are learning opportunities. So instead of feeling guilty about all oh, the mistakes that I made, we can use them to reflect on, okay, how can I do it better next time? So the second tip is focus on the how. So you need to balance between positive feedback and negative feedback. Let's say positive is um, telling your children something that they have done well or something that they have learned, like, a, like any, something that they have improved. And then the negative feedback would be 
not necessarily negative, but something that they still need to work on, something that they need to improve, something related to a mistake or a learning opportunity. So the important thing is to give, no, go back. Give positive feedback regularly. And when you're going to give, I would prefer to call it constructive feedback, you do it privately. Because sometimes children feel exposed and they're, they're, they block themselves because of the emotional part of, being, of feeling exposed to others. And then they will not listen to your feedback and it won't help them grow. The third one would be make sure your feedback that your feedback is specific. Children are very concrete and even for adults. I mean, this, this applies also for companies. If you have a team working for you and you need to give feedback, this also applies. It's always better to be very specific about the information that you're sharing while giving feedback. So for example, um, you can say, remember when you thought adding fractions was really difficult? Today I saw you do them with no trouble. So you're being, you've been very specific, not like, you're not saying like, oh, you're very smart, you were able to do it, or oh, you're a genius in math. That is very broad, and a child can use their imagination to who knows what ideas, and it's not going to help them improve, and it's not going to give them that sense that they are able to learn, even though it might have been difficult at the beginning. So in this example, the, the parent is saying, okay, we you were struggling, implicitly, he or she is saying, you're struggling with adding fractions. It was very difficult for you, and maybe you were frustrated, but today I saw you do it better with no trouble. So there was an improvement. Also, I would like to add that, well, I think it's it's later, but it's it's always better if we focus on the specific behaviors. I think it comes later in, a, in another slide. So let's see the next one. Okay. Ask for permission and give control. And this is something very useful too. And, and it's not only useful for giving feedback, also for solving problems and many other like social skills. When you are giving feedback, avoid the use of you statements here's what you should do or here's what you need to improve because sometimes they become also emotional or they might feel judged and then the, emo the emotions block whatever information you're giving them and that's it instead you can use i statements and for example you may say here's what i would do or here's what works best for me. Maybe you can try this. So asking for their ideas. What do you think you do well? This is another strategy. The first one would be instead of using you statements, use I statements. statements. And the other would be asking them so that they can self-reflect or reflect on their own um, abilities. What do you think you do well? Have you considered trying a different way? Another strategy is to support growth mindset by focusing on the process. And growth mindset is a very broad topic and we can give a, like a webinar just about growth mindset. But when giving feedback, it is very important because in growth mindset, one of the, one of the main ideas is that we are able to learn, to learn and accomplish anything so if you're if right now for example i can say well and this is a this is a true story right now uh i am trying to learn how to play guitar but i would say oh no this is too difficult my fingers are hurting i would never learn how to play it or i can say i don't know how to play it yet and the word yet is very important but if i practice i will learn so growth mindset give the child the ability to reflect on the feedback they receive and evaluate what, if anything, can be learned from it. So you can praise the effort and hard work that went into the success and celebrate mistakes as an opportunity to learn.
So this is like a win-win situation here. Well, as I mentioned before, another tip is to focus on actions rather than personality. Instead of saying you're good or bad in math, in writing, in reading, or whatever subject or activity, you can focus on an event and know the time and place where a behavior occurred then what was the specific behavior and you can describe the behavior what you observe what you heard and what is it what are the consequences note how the behavior affected your thoughts your feelings or actions so one example would be in the next slide for example for an older child it may look like this this morning when we were talking during breakfast, and this isn't related to academics, this morning when we were talking during breakfast, that would be number one, the event, you interrupted Jessica or whoever while she was speaking and said, that's stupid. That would be number two. That is the specific behavior that the child or teenager did before she had a chance to finish. This left me feeling disappointed at, as this comment was rude to her. And then the third component is you share like the consequences, how it made you feel. You never judge the child as a whole, but you focus on the event and the specific behavior that the child did that needs to be improved and how that made you feel or what were the consequences for you. And the last one is model it. And this might feel a little artificial at the beginning, but then it can become like a routine or a, something that you do at your house. You can set up a task that your child can evaluate you doing, for example, letter writing or cooking or, I don't know, cleaning something, something very simple, and actively seek out for feedback. What do you think of this? What could I do better next time? And actually, this is something that we often do. If we, I don't know, bake a cake or some cookies for our children, we want some feedback, right? If, it's, if it was tasty or not. And this is something that we naturally do in our daily lives. But now the important thing is to become a little bit more aware. And then at the end, discuss how the feedback made you feel. And acknowledge that it's difficult to hear harsh things about our own work. But if people say our work is good when it really isn't, then it ruins the opportunity to learn and improve. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed and it's useful. If you have questions, you can write down the comments on the chat and we'll be reading and answering them. So we have one already. It says, sometimes as parents, we do things for our children because it is easier. By doing this, we are not letting them learn from mistakes, which is important in teaching independence. This is more like, like a comment than, than a question. But yes, I mean, in our daily lives, we are rushing so much to go to work, to go to school, to do so many activities. And the easier thing for us is to you know, instead of allowing them to get dressed, we are doing it for, for them. Or, oh no, like, it, 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 the breakfast is taking too long, so I'm going to pull the breakfast into their mouths with the, you know, this is for younger children. But this, this could also happen, like similar situations could also happen with older students. And yes, sometimes, and we don't need to be so, like, hard on ourselves. Sometimes it will happen. Sometimes we need to hurry up and we will do things for our children but the important thing is that we are very mindful about how this will affect um, their ability to be autonomous independent and try to do it the least possible so and also if you start doing like applying these recommendations at home at the beginning it will take a little time you know implementing new routines can can be difficult because it they imply a change in the family system but then as you do them and as they become part of your daily lives they are more and more natural so i don't know if there's more comments or questions i will uh, there's another uh a question there what do you recommend when the kid want to apply procrastination 
at the time to do homework. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is a very interesting question. Um, and uh, uh, this is something uh, well, from counseling. Uh, we, we usually discuss with students and um, when we say the word procrastination and then we explain what it means, they, they, they say, oh yeah, I do that all the time. Yeah, yeah I know, I, I, I do that. And so they feel immediately connected as they understand what's the meaning. So I, what, what I usually, uh, well, there are many factors for um, be, uh, or reasons that uh, behind why a person procrastinates. Even even for us as, as adults, sometimes we do that, and sometimes it it has to do with um, with the fear that people may experience uh, in uh, in completing something. Like if like you know, it can be fear for failure or even for success, like, and, and that's also related to self-esteem, to what they think about themselves. And it's like, okay, I'm not gonna do this because I think it's too difficult. Maybe I'm gonna fail at it. Maybe I'm not gonna do it right. Uh, so I'm gonna avoid it. So procrastination and avoidance are closely related. And the, um, the, the reasons behind that might be you know, several, several factors. One is uh, uh, being afraid to failure or succeed, even though that sounds strange, but yeah, sometimes uh, people or children don't want to be exposed if they, if they feel that uh, they accomplish the, the assignment and it turns out good, feeling exposed like uh, by the teacher or something, or parents, that could also be a reason for preventing them to do what they have to do. And also self-esteem uh, and many other reasons behind the procrastination uh, that needs to be individually understood. Maybe the reasons why I procrastinate are not the same as why you do it. So I, I will say uh, pay attention to what are those tasks or assignments in particular that your child is avoiding and try to, to, to see if, if it's because uh, they feel that they have lack of skills or it, it's difficult for them or any other reason. I also want to 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 mention that um, maybe you know we have several weeks and and uh, through this e-learning experience and right now you might be uh, you might be noticing some changes in behavior uh, and they might be related to uh, what children are feeling like they they might be tired they might be exhausted. Uh, if, if we were at the you know regular school by this time of the school year, uh, we've start also noticing some things at school more conflicts, more uh, a children that used to you know accomplish tasks faster, taking longer. So those are those were expected behaviors in the regular you know school. Uh, system, but now that we are in the virtual and the e-learning experience, we have to rem to remember that we are almost done with the school year. So, being tired, being exhausted is also part of, of, of what is expected, and that might be, you know, related to. Sorry, children could be displaying new behaviors that were not showing until now, and that might be related to the you know, the time, the timing right now. We're almost done with the school year. Yes, and, and also, Yanisel, we, well, there's a comment here. I think this quarantine makes her 
reaction to because she was not like this before. Yes, mm -hmm. of course, it is. It is affecting all of us somehow. Maybe it's more visible in certain behaviors, but emotionally is touching us in different ways. So something that we both wanted to reinforce with this presentation is that um, raising autonomous children doesn't mean that you're not gonna help them, but while you guide them, you will also allow them to do things on their own. And there's one quote that we were discussing about yesterday and it's not included in the presentation, but we will include it later on for you to have it is, I'm gonna read it to you. Um, caring for children is less about teaching them and more about our own way of being. Less about enforcing and more about modeling, less about control and more about guidance, less about regulating their emotions and more about regulating our own. It's less about them and more about us. Managing our own emotions and being mindful of our own behavior is the key to teaching our children how to manage theirs. So, yeah, and that's closely related to what you were saying before about modeling. Uh, we have, I, I know we all know this, but this is something that we need, you know, to, to be more aware of that we are all modeling for children all the time. And when we were talking about family values and, and social norms and everything before, uh, the, the power of modeling is tremendous. So we have to be very careful to what messages we are sending through our own, you know, behavior and responses. Uh, because children can be very, you know, they, they are observing, they are watching, and they, they, they tend to, if they notice that what you are saying is not, um, um congruent with what you are doing it they immediately will, will let you know so it's important to be congruent in what we say and what we model we cannot be trying to teach our children to be honest and then doing you know the opposite or being respectful and then doing the opposite the, the, what we say and what we do has to be you know, incongruence. So uh, that is important. And sometimes we, as adults, we have to pay attention to what message we are sending because uh, remember that at the end, uh, we are we are raising children for life, uh, and they will go out to society to deal with the right and wrong. They will be exposed to many things, and they will have to make their own choices. What are the choices we want our children to make? We want, of course, I'm sure you all, or the response to that question will be good choices. But, and, and you know, making mistakes is part of life. And, and as, Ms., as Ms. Roxana said before, that growth mindset um, that we help them develop uh, becomes a powerful self dialogue because sometimes growth mindset, uh, the, the, the self dialogue or the inner dialogue can be very negative and that comes from a, from a fixed mindset in which, you, in which you tell yourself, oh, you're so stupid, you're so dumb, you cannot do anything right. And that negative self dialogue usually comes from what we are constantly listening from the people around us. So we have to be very careful with the, the messages we're sending to children either exp in an explicit way through through words or in a more uh, in conscious or implicit way such as behave such as our behaviors so uh, let's try to keep this in mind to, to just to be careful with the way we talk to our children because they are listening okay Ms. Neher has a comment here of course it's better when children make their own choices there's another one coming before, uh, before oh sorry uh-huh you want to read it no go ahead it's okay oh uh, i'm trying to let the kids do their school activities on their own timing mm -hmm. and i have surprised them watching a video for example when they're supposed to be doing their reading or writing how to find a middle term where I don't need to sneak peek in their backs to see what they are doing, but clearly saying that there is an order in priorities. Any ideas? 
I've tried the talking and shame on me, reward punishment, but I'm sure there must be something else. Roxy, you wanna you wanna comment? Well, it um, I mean it reward and it's we don't call it punishment right now, more like consequences. So you can focus more on the consequences. What are the consequences of you doing your being staying focused and doing your homework or your assignment instead of watching videos? The consequence will be that in once you finish, you have a lot of time in the afternoon to do like fun things or a family activity or rest or do whatever within his or her possibilities um, could be um, more attractive than an assignment. And what is the consequence of not doing it? You still have to do it today. You still have to turn in your assignments today. So if right now you are choosing to watch this video, then, well, maybe in the afternoon you need to complete that. Something that we planned before might not be possible right now because you didn't complete your assignment on time. So I really uh, like this approach and it's actually uh, part of the responsive classroom approach that we started to implement fully in, in elementary school, this academic school year. And it talks about helping them reflect that everything they do is going to have a consequence and it's not it's like a natural reward that they will get if they will do it and if they don't it won't be a punishment it will just be what naturally comes after you know not working on time so um that could be one approach yeah i want to add something to that and also like as you were saying before there, do we have to try to do, to find a way like to connect to, to previous experiences and you can remind them about that day that they finished their assignments on time or before than expected and how did that how did that feel you can you can bring them to that moment in which they feel uh, good and they have more time in the afternoon to play or watch videos because they finished on time so do you remember that day and they will say yeah no, or no if you, you can help them remember and then you can say well uh it's up to you if you want to invest your time right now uh watching videos well you will finish later you will finish it will take you longer and the the time that you were you were supposed to have in the afternoon you're not gonna be you know allowed to use it or you're gonna now you're gonna use it to to finish your schoolwork so it's helping them to understand that the uh, the impact of their decisions is on the on the on them like could, so you decide what what you want to do right now because that's a that's a power you know of, of autonomy it's like helping them making their own choices but at the same time dealing with the consequence the negative or positive consequence of of whether choice they make mm -hmm. i would also um i mean if it's something like very that happens very often i would also like ask them or you know what are the activities that they're usually doing when they become distracted is it usually in the morning in the afternoon um to sort of understand what is going on um and why they are not interested in the in what they are doing or what or why they are avoiding this assignment particularly and choosing to do something else and like once you know that information you can make some decisions about you know maybe you can help your child with some specific um, assignments that are more challenging for them it's not that you're gonna do it for them but maybe they need you to be there while they complete something that is more challenging so you know being with your child while, while doing an assignment is is nothing bad you can be there if there's something that they find really difficult or challenging and they need your support so if it if it's something like once or twice that happened then of course learning from consequences we all do that and if it's something that is recurring then you might try to understand a little bit more what's going on with that assignment and then plan something from that point we have yeah. two more. Ms. Nehor has another comment here. It says, 
Of course, it's better when children make their own choices, but sometimes they need some motivation mm -hmm. when they don't want to do homework. Is it too bad if we offer them like a prize if they do? For example, TV is not allowed until children finish the finish homework. Well, in that example, I will say I was I see it more as a as a rule, as a family rule. Like TV is not allowed until children finish homework. It, it is not a prize. It, it is a like a consequence. Like so, if you finish your homework, you're gonna be allowed to watch TV. In that case, I don't see it as a prize. It, it's a logical consequence. If you finish, you can watch TV. If you don't, then you cannot watch it. It's a, it's a, it's a logical consequence. Remember that we went, when we said before, when we offer prizes uh, for, for, for something that we expect them to do, it, it, they, they could start doing things for pleasing, for pleasing others, for pleasing you or for pleasing the person that is uh, offering something in reward. And that's what we don't want because that is that is not an autonomous uh, response. You know, uh, autonomy has to do with the with the opportunity to make their own choices, whether it's good, negative, or positive. Uh, it's your choice, and then you have to deal with the consequences of making that choice. So, but if you're offering something for what I expect you to do, then that motivation it's it's external and that is, at the end, I don't think that helps uh, any children to become more autonomous because they will, you know, start relying on, okay, if you, if you give me this, then I will do this. And for schoolwork and for, for chores at home or for, you know, uh, rules in the house, I will say these are non-negotiables. I mean, you have to do it or you have to do it. Um, but but as we have mentioned in other webinars, these are things that you need maybe to discuss in an explicit way with your children, like set up the rules and agreements and, and help them also become part of those agreements and, and allow them to, to, to give their opinions. Okay. Super. Well, okay, so I think we are on time now. Thank you very much for joining us today. Remember that we do these webinars every Thursday from 2 to 3 p.m. Now we are sharing uh, the flyers on different, you know, on CISO, on our, on our Instagram account as reminders for you and also sharing the, the topic. So if someone, if you know of someone who wasn't able to come, please let them know that we upload these videos on our YouTube channel, on the Metropolitan School of Panama YouTube channel, and that we also share the um, the PDF of the of our presentation in the counselor's website. So you can also have access to that. Thank yeah, you. and next week we're gonna be talking about um, sex or how to talk about sex to our children. So we cordially invite you to join us next Thursday. Okay. See you next Thursday, bye-bye.